everyone and welcome to the very first episode of Fuel the Pedal podcast. We are finally here. I am your host Gabriel Martins and I intend to stay like that for a long time. Thank you for tuning in into this show. What a fantastic way we have of starting this. The title of this first episode is Breakfast for Cyclists. Should they deplete before they eat? And here we'll be discussing the relevance of having breakfast, uh, the training in the fasted state, and even how the type of breakfast can be of importance for cycling performance or for increasing training adaptations, along with all the evidence behind it. I couldn't think of a better person to invite on the show to talk with us about this. So today we are lucky enough to have with us Javier Gonzalez from the University of Bath in the UK. He kindly accepted being on this very first episode, so without further ado, let's get on to it. Hi Javier, uh, thank you so much for accepting being on the show. How are you doing? Hi, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be the first guest on your podcast, so thank you very much for the invite. Okay, no problem. I'm really excited to have you here, Javier. Um, you've showed, uh, you've surely showed a lot of bravery in accepting being the first guest on the show, and uh, I'm sure we will all learn a lot from from you today. And so uh, I will ask our listeners to stay tuned for the next minutes. So, um, Javier, I've already introduced you before, but could you please provide us with a brief presentation of yourself, uh, your background, and uh, how did you come to study the topics we are covering today on the show, and eventually some research that you might be doing at the moment? Yeah, um, well, I'm a, a senior lecturer at the University of Bath, which I guess is a, a UK term. So if you're from abroad, then it's more like an associate professor role. Um, and that's in human physiology. Um, but my specialism is, is nutrition and metabolism. And I got to that role having studied an undergraduate degree in sport and exercise science. And I was always fascinated by how nutrition can influence performance in, in that regard. Um, I think looking back, it was probably a, a lab class in the second year of that degree where um, the, the effect of sodium bicarbonate on performance just seemed so profound. So I, I was the participant in that lab and um, it was so profound, it, it left a lasting effect on me and I wanted to understand how these things work. So then after my undergraduate degree, I performed a master's in exercise physiology and then I moved up to Newcastle in the northeast of England to complete a PhD under the supervision of Professor Emma Stevenson, and that was in human nutrition and metabolism, mainly studying the effects of breakfast consumption um, in combination with exercise on, on metabolism and appetite. Following that, I completed a postdoc still up in Newcastle, um, looking at liver and muscle glycogen metabolism during exercise. And then I moved down to Bath, and I've been here for about five years now. Um, so I mix teaching and research. And essentially, I'm interested in carbohydrate and fat metabolism and how they relate to both health and disease. So in the health aspect, I'm very much interested in endurance performance and how we can manipulate carbohydrate and fat metabolism mainly within cycling, um, but also a bit of running as well and some other sports too. Um, and then in the disease um, area, I'm very much interested in insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance and also a bit around lipid metabolism and cardiovascular disease. So again, how we can manipulate carbohydrate and fat metabolism to reduce the risk of metabolic disease. Okay, awesome, Javier. That's uh... Quite a, quite a resume and you're surely the, the right person to talk about this topic and hopefully at the end of this episode our listeners can, can understand firstly what is breakfast because it's, it all begins with that because it's, I believe it's not uh, easy to define and if there, are there any moments in a cyclist routine in which uh, skipping breakfast can make sense or in the case of having breakfast what would be the ideal uh, breakfast for a cyclist in order to maximize performance? And again, uh, the idea of this of, of all this podcast is uh, is to apply all these uh, contents for cycling, especially for cycling performance or to training adaptations. But this uh, will always be the base of this uh, podcast. So Javier, when I told my colleagues in in Portugal, some some research friends that I have that was going to interview me, uh, interview you, uh, they told me, oh yeah, yeah, the fructose guy. 
Um, <laughs> and I said, well, well, in this case, it would be more the breakfast guy in this case. So uh, do you often get this uh, label among research colleagues as well? Um, well, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that. <laughs> no, but it's it's funny. I, I think maybe with certain topics that we study a little bit more, people start to identify us with some some specific uh, uh, topic. And uh, you know, at least now you know that in some part of the world, uh, people recognize you with uh, a specific level of some of your um, great great research and specific research that has been, at least in my case, helped me a lot. Uh, um, in my practice and uh, every time I, I, I teach as well. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah, it's, it's great that someone reads it. <laughs> no, believe me, <laughs> there are people reading them and citing them and everything. So, Javier, um, we have to start with this question. What, mm -hmm. uh, what is breakfast and what has changed on breakfast research in the past 10 years? Yeah, um, breakfast is actually very tricky to define. Um, we, we might come up with a few definitions of our own. Some people might think that, well, it's easy to define breakfast. It's just the first meal of the day. That's tricky when you think that you might wake up at, say, 8 a.m. and maybe you don't eat anything. Maybe the first thing you eat is at 1 p.m. and you've had quite a long extended fasting period over that morning. By that first definition, that is still breakfast at 1 p.m. Um, because it's the first meal of the day. The second definition might be, well, we could say within the first two hours of waking, it's the first meal that you have then. Um, but let's say you have a big night out, um, you're out till 3 a.m., then you sleep in, and again, you wake up now at midday, and you have um, your first meal at 1 p.m., Well, that's still within two hours of waking. Um, but for everyone else around you, they're eating their lunch, you're eating with them. Do you classify it as breakfast or as lunch? The, there are multiple issues with this. Another one is that um, what you would classify as a meal. So you could theoretically have um, quite a small bowl of um, cereal or you, you may even have just a slice of toast as your breakfast with just a, a few hundred kilocalories. You could um, get someone else who then doesn't think they're having breakfast. They think, I'm just going to have a coffee. Um, they could just have a black coffee, which barely has any calories in it. Um, whereas someone else could have a large latte with cream on and some sugar um, with more calories in than the, some, than the other person who's just had a, a slice of toast. Because it's liquid calories, some people would presume, well, it's a coffee, it's not a meal, so that's not my breakfast. Yet from a, an energy balance perspective, they're certainly taking in a lot of calories and it's going to have a metabolic impact on them. So um, certainly from a physiological standpoint, it's it's they're breaking the fast, they're, they're uh, eating something. Um, even with the coffee, if we take a black coffee um, that doesn't have many calories in it, it's still a stimulant, it's providing caffeine. So some people might argue that that's still influencing things from a basal metabolic rate, and therefore you're not truly fasted because you've had some stimulatory um, nutrient there. So it's very tricky to define what breakfast is. And, and that's where if you're reading the literature, um, certain studies will define it in different ways. And you should always read that in the methods to, in order for your, your interpretation of those. In terms of what's changed in the last 10 years or so, um, it's probably that there have been uh, now a good few number of randomized controlled trials on breakfast consumption. So that there have been a few in the past as well, very well conducted ones, um, but, but only really a handful of them. And most of the evidence on breakfast consumption is, a, is based on observational data. So that is where we just ask people, do you or do you not consume breakfast? As we've just mentioned, the definition of that for each individual could vary. So that's tricky in itself to just ask people whether they consume or don't consume breakfast and then track some of their behaviors or, or just measure their body weight, for example. And what the observational evidence suggested was that people who regularly consume breakfast or, or say that they regularly consume breakfast are much less likely to be overweight or obese than those who report regularly skipping breakfast. And that observation is consistent around the world in different populations, and it's been reported many, many times. But observation doesn't necessarily infer causation. So the only way we can properly determine cause and effect between a behavior 
and an outcome is to perform a randomized controlled trial. And there have been some randomized controlled trials now on breakfast consumption. They're, again, their definition of, of breakfast varies slightly. Um, but one of those was conducted by uh, a good colleague and friend of mine at Bath called Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor James Betts. Um, he conducted the Bath Breakfast Project, um, which was a randomized controlled trial. And it was the first randomized controlled trial to assess the effect of breakfast consumption on all major components of energy balance. So what James was interested in was whether consuming breakfast influences these different components of energy balance, and, and I'll break those down in a moment, to influence weight change over time. So this relationship that's commonly observed between breakfast intake and body weight, um, what is actually underlying that? Because if you, in the observational evidence, it seems that people who consume breakfast also seem to report eating more throughout the day as well. So that suggests something else might be going on which makes these people leaner. Um, and so just to go back to, to those components of energy balance. So these are the energy balance is ultimately what's dictating long term changes in body weight. And we can break down energy balance into energy intake on the one hand and then energy expenditure on the other. So if we start with energy intake, um, we should really refer to metabolizable energy intake. And that is the energy that we eat from food and drink um, that we actually absorb as well. So some of that we won't absorb um, from the intestine and it will be excreted in the feces. But the vast majority we will absorb and the variance between people in the amount they absorb is actually relatively small to the amount they eat. So most of what we will, will, we will absorb and will become available to the circulation. On the energy expenditure side, we've got three main components of energy expenditure. We've got resting metabolic rate. So that's the energy we need just to keep ourselves alive and keep all of our processes going at a, a basal state. We've then got the thermic effects of feeding. So that's the energy we invest to digest absorb and metabolize the food that we eat so that that has an energy cost to it and that will vary depending on the foods we eat so it's quite well known that if you, you consume protein for example you get a um, you actually feel slightly hotter after you eat a large protein meal compared to a lower protein meal and that's mainly due to this thermic effect because most protein meals um, or most proteins have a thermic effect of about 30 percent so essentially 30 percent of the energy is is if you like wasted it's not necessarily wasted but it, it's used in the processes of digestion metabolism and, and absorption and and you give that off as heat so you, you feel a bit hotter then the the final one is one that many people overlook especially in some of these large scale studies because it's very it's difficult to measure um and that is physical activity energy expenditure it's also very variable which makes it tricky too so um physical activity energy expenditure is the energy we use um, to produce movement or um, at least muscle force production. Um, and that can be as simple as just fidgeting, um, tapping your foot on the floor, or it could be um, at the other extreme going for a run and doing some form of exercise. So exercise is a, a subcomponent of physical activity and physical activity encaptures all of those. And this bre breakfast research re revealed some interesting findings in those energy balance components. It confirmed that the observations that people who consume breakfast um, eat more calories throughout the day, that that seems to be true. So if you randomize people and you say to them, please consume breakfast for this next six weeks, and you randomize another group of people to not eat anything, any calorie containing food or drinks until midday every day for six weeks, then consuming breakfast increases total daily energy intake. But that seems to be offset by an increase in physical activity energy expenditure. Um, so that was probably the main takeaway finding from some of that breakfast research. And it, it kind of shows one of the potential um, mechanisms by which breakfast may influence weight regulation. But um, at least based on most of the randomized controlled trials, it seems to be a negligible effect, i.e. consuming breakfast or not doesn't necessarily impact body weight because any changes in energy intake are offset by changes in energy expenditure. But of course, an increase in physical activity and an increase in energy intake is still an increase in total energy turnover. So we're more physically active, but we're eating more. And that probably has other health effects that we could maybe come on to later.
Okay, Javier, that was that was great. That was uh, a ton of information to start with, <laughs> which is which is good because it it um, it it's, it uh, it shows our listeners that this is tricky to define, and there are many many components in, involved in the in breakfast, in having breakfast, or even in defining breakfast. And surely there's a lot of uh, new information in the in the past years that make makes this uh, topic really really interesting. And of course there is this um, this recent meta analysis that we will uh, get onto it um, in the in at the end of the show. I will then ask you mm -hmm. after Javier to make a, a comment about this. But uh, that part is I think it's quite important to clarify that um, in randomized control tri control trials it seems uh, it seems uh, consistent that uh, skipping breakfast has some effect on uh, on total energy intake uh, throughout the day. It seems that people tend to eat uh, less, but then people who eat breakfast, on the other hand, they tend to uh, be more physically active and uh, and uh, have a more uh, a superior energy expenditure. But uh, in the context of uh, cycling and the context of of uh, really elite athletes. Um, is there any are there any benefits in the case of of skipping breakfast are there any benefits uh, that could uh, impact directly the athlete's performance or the athlete's uh, training yeah um it again adds another layer of complexity with, with athletes or or perhaps simplifies things because hmm. here we've got the the physical activity energy expenditure that i i just described um is mainly spontaneous physical activity. So if you take a, a group of people from the, the general population who, who don't perform structured exercise, um, then that gives you variability in their physical activity that, that isn't necessarily planned or, or structured. And that's where I think breakfast consumption can subtly influence their behaviors throughout the day to accumulate physical activity. Whereas with athletes, typically they're going to be following some kind of training program. And so much of their exercise is actually a prescribed energy expenditure. And that gives them less of a window in which this spontaneous physical activity can be altered by breakfast consumption. So to use that to our advantage, that may be actually where at least certain times and certain days of the week, perhaps athletes could skip breakfast. So they achieve that uh, reduction in energy intake. Um, but because their energy expenditure is prescribed and they're determined by the exercise training that they're doing, hopefully that's not going to be influenced so much by having skipped breakfast. Now, there aren't really any long term studies on that and that that kind of question really needs answering in in an athletic population performing a, a training study um but the other area that um, outside of energy balance that, that athletes might look to do with with fasted exercise could be by um augmenting the adaptation to exercise and that and to, just to describe what what i mean by that it's probably quite a, a muscle specific focus so if when we do particularly endurance exercise, we get um, a number of adaptations in many physiological systems in, in the body. Um, but one of those is that um, the muscle adapts to exercise training. There are changes in fuel use. So um, we increase our capacity to use fat as a fuel during exercise. We increase our capacity to store muscle glycogen, the carbohydrates stored in muscle. Um, we also increase the number of mitochondria we have within muscle with, with endurance training. And there's a suggestion um, that by restricting carbohydrate availability, and one of the ways we can do that is by skipping breakfast um, and performing our exercise session in an overnight fasted state, we may be able to increase the adaptation specifically within muscle, in response to endurance training. Uh -huh. no, that's, that, that, that's great. And I think that's in, the, in, the, in 10 years ago, if we were discussing breakfast, these are all stuff that we would never talk about. And today, I believe that it's uh, quite unanimous. And I think these this, this, uh, protocols have been in implemented in some some cycling teams about this uh, benefit when done uh, controlled of course uh, of skipping breakfast or training in a fasted state but, but uh, we will see um, we will see uh, in uh, following episode uh, 
without the guess that uh, there are many ways uh, of doing this. Um, but Javier, uh, before getting into that, um, I would like to ask you if this affects that we've been uh, talking about the uh, imp the mitochondrial, improved the mitochondrial biogenesis, the increased fat oxidation, the incre increased uh, glycogen sparing. Are these effects uh, different between... Um, let's say, sedentary subjects or uh, slightly trained subjects and elite athletes? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and um, to my knowledge, there isn't a direct comparison of those. So I, I'm speculating, but there are a number of interesting um, speculations on, on that. So firstly, um, in people who are completely untrained to begin with, almost any form of exercise is a very big stimulus for them. So they will adapt to almost anything. Compare that to a highly trained athlete, and it's actually really difficult for them, them to further adapt. So um, if you get them to do a, a hard interval training program, the, the endurance trained athlete, the signal to their muscle is massively blunted. So the signal for them to adapt is, is down regulated because they're so highly trained. And that's where, in order to ramp up that signal, we need to try to employ some other strategies. We could increase the training volume, but there's only so so much you can increase that volume. Um, similarly, with intensity, you, you can increase it somewhat, but um, high volume and high intensity training all the time is probably going to increase injury risk and certainly is psychologically really, really challenging too. So maybe with some forms of carbohydrate manipulation, such as skipping breakfast and performing exercise in a fasted state, we can ramp up the signal to muscle um, in, or, in order to adapt. Um, so that's where maybe in a trained individual, fasted versus fed state exercise could make more of a difference than in an untrained individual, because essentially with an untrained individual, any stimulus is such a big stimulus for, from exercise itself. And so the minor details around the edge make, make little difference. On, on the other hand, um, or essentially in, in, in support of that too, but a separate point is that um, in untrained individuals, they're probably less likely to be metabolically flexible. And, and just to define what metabolic flexibility is typically referred to, it's, it's the change in substrate use from fasted to fed states. So in the fasted state, most people will predominantly be using fat as a fuel. And then when we eat a meal, particularly containing carbohydrates and protein that are going to elicit an insulin response, then we switch from mainly burning uh, fat, to a, fat as a fuel to burning carbohydrates predominantly as a fuel. And that switch is called metabolic flexibility. So if we're highly metabolically flexible, we burn a lot of fat when we're fasted and we burn a lot of carbohydrate when we're in the fed state or under hyperinsulinemia when we've got a lot of insulin circulating. Um, in people who are untrained or particularly insulin resistant, then we see less metabolic flexibility. So in these people, they're burning a bit more carbohydrate during the fasted state, and then they show a blunted response to the fed state. So they don't switch so much from burning um, fat to carbohydrate. Now, one of the stimuli we think to adapt to exercise is the substrates that you're using. So um, with, with carbohydrate restriction and fasting, we think that there are at least two main ways in which that's stimulating the muscle to adapt. One might be glycogen availability in the muscle. So when you perform exercise, you deplete your muscle glycogen. And that in itself might be a signal to stimulate some of these adaptive responses that we're looking for. And the second might be independent from glycogen. If, that's, if glycogen is the same in both conditions, if we increase fatty acid availability to muscle, then that might also independently increase some of these um, adaptations that, that we're looking for. So if you've got someone who's not so metabolically flexible, so they don't show such a difference between fasted and fed state exercise, then maybe because that difference in substrate use isn't so great, also the difference in adaptations isn't so great too. So essentially just to summarize all of that together, it, whilst there isn't direct evidence, it would make sense based on what we currently know that – 
the difference between fasted and fed state exercise for some of these adaptive responses that we're looking for, that difference is likely to be greater. And this strategy is probably more beneficial in people who are well-trained compared to those, those who are untrained. Okay, that's really, really important to, to clarify, I think, to, to put things in a, in a context and to know that there are many, many, many things to, to consider uh, when, uh, when considering a, a, a exercise in a fasted state or in a fed state. And um, we will get into more detail on what is fat oxidation and what is uh, implied uh, beyond fat oxidation. Uh, but first, uh, Javier, let's get a bit into the, uh, the glycogen uh, topic. And we all know that uh, muscle glycogen is, uh, is undeniable for uh, its importance is undeniable for performance. And it's ultimately the main substrate uh, to be oxidized by the body at uh, high intensities, of course. And we want to spare that, that same uh, fuel, that same uh, substrate uh, on athletes athletes um, in order for them to be more metabolically efficient. So this is quite a, a personal question that I have as well, because I don't think this is quite uh, differentiated or really explained in some some of the research that we uh, that we uh, that we look for uh, considering that we have of course as you have mentioned two major stores of glycogen uh, muscle and liver are there any differences between training with low liver glycogen uh, or and uh, low uh, muscle glycogen because we can get both both uh, we can create both uh, situations correct me if i'm wrong because if yeah. we are training in a fasted state in the morning having had carbohydrates at dinner the night before we are essentially training with low liver glycogen because we haven't been uh, um, uh, wasting or spending uh, muscle glycogen and if we do, if we do a sleep low uh, training strategy with no carbs at night, uh, the night before, and then no carbs at breakfast, and then performing a morning session, uh, we will be uh, both with uh, muscle and liver uh, depleted, liver glycogen depleted. Is there any difference in the molecular signaling and uh, muscle adaptations to any of these process processes? Yeah, that, that is a fantastic question, and it's one I'd, I'd love to know the answer to. Um, and I guess you could throw a third condition into the mix, and that would be to maintain high liver glycogen but um, produce a low muscle glycogen. And you could do that too by um, by starting exercise in a overnight fasted state. Your liver glycogen would be slightly depleted, um, but then if you ingest carbohydrates during exercise – You can prevent liver glycogen depletion, um, but you'll still utilize your muscle glycogen at, at the same rate pretty much. So um, you could then have a scenario where you've got low muscle glycogen, but you've got relatively high liver glycogen. And and the simple answer is, is we just don't know. That, that study hasn't been done, but, but would be fascinating to do. Um, but again, we can speculate as to certainly some of the, the metabolic changes that, that would happen in that regard and how they may relate to, to adaptation. Um, So if we take the comparison of, of training with low liver glycogen um, alone versus um, low liver and low muscle glycogen, then um, muscle glycogen in itself is certainly a, a signal to um, stimulate AMPK activity in muscle. So AMPK is, is a major energy sensing um, protein in, in muscle. It senses when energy availability is low and it's present in many cells but in in the muscle it performs a number of important functions it, it seems to be involved in um, glucose um, uptake via translocation of, of specific protein so when you've got high ampk activity that promotes glucose uptake into muscle and and is partly responsible for some of these apparent insulin sensitizing effects of exercise but for the endurance training adaptations it also seems to be involved in the, the stimulation of uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. So we essentially want to increase AMPK activity in muscle um, during exercise training sessions. So clearly having low muscle glycogen can directly influence AMPK activity. So we, when we've got low muscle glycogen, we can have high AMPK activity, which is, is something we're, we're looking for in this regard. In, in that scenario, if we then get a change in liver glycogen content, then we can see changes in whole body substrate metabolism. So liver glycogen is, is 
interesting in that it, it seems to be linked to the brain, at least in, in non-human animal models. There, there's a really nice, a few really nice studies where um, they manipulate the link between the liver and the brain by vagotomizing the, these rodents. So um, they essentially cut the vagal nerve. So that's a nerve that links the brain to the liver. And when you do that, you alter um, lipolysis from adipose tissue. So when these mice have high liver glycogen, that sends a signal to the brain, which then relays to adipose tissue, to fat tissue, to downregulate lipolysis. So we get low fatty acid availability from adipose tissue. So when we've got high liver glycogen, with all else being equal, we're going to get lower rates of lipolysis and lower uh, availability of fatty acids to muscle from from the adipose tissue. Um, so if when we deplete liver glycogen, the opposite should occur. We should get higher mm. fatty acid availability to muscle from adipose tissue. That in itself, at least again in rodents, seems to regulate some of the uh, early adaptive responses to exercise. So um, there are some nice studies where they've independently raised fatty acid availability. So what they, they do in these studies is they infuse um, lipids straight into the, the bloodstream, um, usually a triglyceride, and then they also infuse heparin, which causes the hydrolysis of that fat. So it breaks it down into fatty acids. You also get a number of other metabolites as well that may be um, important, but one of the main things this does is it, it rapidly raises blood levels of, of fatty acids. And just by doing that, it seems to, seems to uh, stimulate the muscle of these animals to um, start off all these signaling processes that that we think are involved in adaptation. So it, um, essentially to, to answer that question in, in one way would be to get the most out of the training, you probably want to train with both low uh, liver glycogen and low muscle glycogen. But I'd also say that is with all else being equal. So we don't know if the training would feel a lot harder. And that may also have implications for how much training you do. And that could offset um, the adaptation that you could perhaps get if you had a bit more liver glycogen and you could perform that session a little bit harder and a little bit for longer. Um, so it's, it's a tricky question to answer, but um, that, that's what I probably speculate on so far. Yeah, that is so, so interesting. And I believe we could do a, a whole podcast series just around this question because it has so much to, to talk about and so, so many variables to consider. And I, I really can't wait to, for the evidence on this topic to, to, to get in a little bit um, deeper because uh, it would be really interesting to, to quantify the uh, difference between the different uh, methods of doing uh, this uh, carb low approaches. Uh, and in order to apply them to specific contexts. So um, the next question, Javier, I, I, I think it's probably one of the most key uh, uh, central questions around this, I consider. Um, because when we talk about uh, fasting, uh, we could, there is some debate, I think, in which is it fasting or is it carbohydrate restriction that triggers all this molecular signal? Could we eventually achieve the same results with uh, a protein or a fat-rich uh, breakfast? Yeah, again, another great question. And, and there's been a little bit of work in this area, um, some at least by, by Sam Impey, who when he was at Liverpool, John Morse. And I know you'll be interviewing him shortly, I believe. Um, and that, that seems to suggest at least some of the early um, signaling responses. Um, you seem to be able to get if you just carbohydrate restrict. So if you still give protein, it seems like some of these early signaling events seem to still occur. Now, I should just, just take a step back a second and, and explain kind of the, the metabolic responses to consuming carbohydrate, protein, and fat. So if we consume isocaloric, so the same total amount of energy as carbohydrate, and let's take maltodextrin as a, a kind of a uh, quite a high glycemic index carbohydrate, so it's going to produce a, a pretty big insulin response and glucose response. Um, if we compare that to the same energy intake but from whey protein, then we actually still get a very big insulin response. So we're going to suppress fatty acid availability somewhat. What's really interesting, though, is that for the same insulin response, if you compare whey protein to maltodextrin, then it doesn't suppress fatty acid availability quite so much. 
We don't really know what's going on there, but it does mean that if fatty acid availability is important for for the muscle, then potentially there's something in that. So we can provide whey protein in the, and substitute that in for carbohydrate, and we may be able to um, still get an increase in fatty acid availability relative to fasting. Yeah, oh, sorry an increase in fatty acid availability relative to carbohydrate intake, but it's probably not going to be the same level that we see during complete fasting. Um, so if we want the most um, fat utilization during exercise, and if we think that's important for some of this adaptive response, um, then fasting per se is probably the best way to go. Um, if we want some middle ground and perhaps we just can't get on with fasting for that long and we want to take on some protein and there are certainly other benefits to protein ingestion. There may be benefits on, on bone health, for example, or immune function. Um, then it's probably a good compromise because we're still getting some increase in fatty acid availability, at least relative to carbohydrate intake. Um, but we're also getting some of the other benefits of protein ingestion too. Now, if we compare that to the final one of, of fat ingestion alone, um, then most fats barely produce any insulin response at all. Um, so you essentially get the same fat and carbohydrate oxidation response than you do to the fasted state. Sometimes that's misinterpreted by the general public as eating a, a fat rich breakfast stimulates fat oxidation. That's almost certainly not the case. And, and I know there's some great work coming out of Birmingham from Gareth Wallace's group soon, um, showing that if and this just supports some, some other data too, that if you overconsume fat, then you don't necessarily increase fat oxidation, at least ac acutely anyway. What's happening there is that you're just getting the same response to the fasted state because fats essentially are, if you like, in that sense, a neutral um, macronutrient. You, you get a neutral response compared to fasting, whereas both carbohydrate and insulin uh, sorry, both carbohydrate and protein produce an insulin response, which suppresses fat oxidation and increases carbohydrate oxidation. Okay, I think that's really important to get out there to our to our listeners uh, and to to know that there are different uh, different. Uh, parts of this and different uh, ways of directly stimulating and of course di uh, different ways of uh, implementing this strategy that might be not the case that there might be the case that some athlete um, doesn't adapt well to fasting and then we can therefore consider a, a low carb but uh, high protein breakfast for these uh, these um, specific athlete and that there are many ways of um, of doing this Nevertheless, uh, it seems that uh, uh, s uh, skipping at all the meal itself appears to uh, to provide the the the, the most uh, intensive uh, um, uh, signaling or, or or training adaptations. So, uh, Javier, when we talk about um, fat oxidation and increasing um, uh, increasing uh, the these adaptations. Normally, uh, in the context I have contact with uh, in uh, in cycling, athletes and and also the general population they do this because I want to burn more fat, I want to lose more fat. I'm doing this, I'm skipping this meal. They're not necessarily training, uh, thinking about training adaptations. That's our role. Normally, we nutritionists or or sports scientists we are worried about that, but they just want to lose fat. So. I believe it should be maybe important to clarify what exactly is fat oxidation. When we talk about this increased fat oxidation, and please correct me if I'm wrong in anything that I am uh, saying, maybe fat oxidation is just a an indicator or a marker of increased mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, but people nevertheless and cyclists think that it is... A, increased uh, in, they are losing fat at the, that specific moment is that what really happens when we talk about fat oxidation are we actually uh, burning sort of saying adipose tissue are we uh, using intramuscular triglycerides free fatty acids what's your opinion on this mm -hmm. um, in the in the overnight fasted state when we exercise the fats that are contributing to, to fat oxidation are both, um, or it's a, it's a mixture of many 
fats, but the major ones are um, adipose tissue derived fats. So that's the, the triglyceride that's stored in our adipose tissue or our, our fat tissue. Um, that's released into the circulation as non-esterified fatty acids. Those, they circulate around the blood and they go to muscle and they're, they're burnt there as a fuel. The second one is intramuscular triglycerides. So they're the triglycerides stored within the muscle. And they also contribute to, to fat oxidation during exercise. And then there are some other um, sources too, but they're, they're more minor. Um, if we consume a breakfast before exercise, then that seems to suppress um, the availability of fatty acids from adipose tissue, but it also seems to suppress um, the utilization of intramuscular triglyceride as well. So we're suppressing fat oxidation from, from both of those sources. From a health standpoint, that's probably important for both of those. Um, so there is a suggestion that a high turnover of intramuscular triglyceride stores is probably a good thing for metabolic health. So we want to be utilizing those stores. In terms of adipose tissue as well, um, there's some work from, from Stanley Chen, who is at Bath and is now back in Taiwan as a lecturer. Um, he, he did some work with us and, and Dylan Thompson led on this too. Um, they showed that if you consume breakfast before a single bout of exercise, then that, that blunts even our adipose tissue response to exercise. So if you just measure the gene expression in adipose tissues, or in other words, the, the switching on and off of different genes, then our adipose tissue even adapts to exercise. It, it seems to be stimulated in response to exercise, but that response is blunted if you consume breakfast before that exercise session. Now, we don't know the long-term effects of that in humans, but there is some really nice rodent evidence again showing that if you've got healthy adipose tissue that's been, if you like, exercise trained, then that seems to interact with all other organs in the body to improve metabolic health. So maybe um, we want to be increasing the adaptation of both muscle and of adipose tissue to training. Now, you mentioned the, the potential that just measuring fat oxidation is merely a marker of mitochondrial biogenesis. And it probably is a good marker of that with all else being equal. So if you just take a, a big group of people, you measure them all in the overnight fasted state, you measure their fat oxidation rate, then probably those who have more mitochondria will be those who are oxidizing more fat. But that doesn't mean to say that that can, can't be acutely manipulated. So if you take all of those same individuals and you give them a meal, pretty much all of them should show a suppression of fat oxidation in the fed state when compared to the fasted state. Now, whether that has any implications for weight loss is slightly different. Um, if in the context of energy balance, if we clamp energy balance, then there's not any evidence that specifically oxidizing fat will result in fat loss over time. Um, and that's because over a very long time, over months, things all balance out. And that's mainly because we have this drastically limited capacity to store carbohydrate. So if we get changes in fat balance and changes in carbohydrate balance, we over the long term will get equilibration of the carbohydrate stores because they ha they, we just have a limited capacity to store them. They can't be um, full more than their capacity. And uh, we also have a tight regulation of their depletion again. again so we, we try to restore them. So in the long term, that's where energy balance reflects uh, body fat. So long-term changes in energy balance essentially predict body fat. Having said that, if we're manipulating substrate use during exercise and we're increasing fat oxidation, we are indeed in that moment burning more fat from our adipose tissue and from our intramuscular triglycerides. It's probably offset later on um, by other energy intake, but... By doing that, we may influence energy balance behaviors in order to promote a negative energy balance. And, and this certainly needs more work in the area. But, but there's a suggestion that people who burn more fat during exercise are less likely to compensate with their energy intake later in the day. So, it, again, it may link to this capacity to store carbohydrates. So if we if we're burning more fat, we're sparing our carbohydrate stores. And there may be some evolutionary adaptations that um, try to protect those carbohydrate stores. So when we're detecting that they're low or that we're utilizing our carbohydrate stores very quickly, maybe that stimulates some signal for us to eat more or be physically less physically active. 
And I guess that the most direct evidence that for that for the moment comes from rodents again. And, and whilst I'm a human physiologist, so I'd always refer to human evidence when it's available. But the, these rodent studies really can pick at some of these mechanisms. And what they've shown there using the, the vagotomy of, of um, the liver, again, using it quite a neat model, is that um, uh, rodents that have high liver glycogen, so they genetically increase their, their liver glycogen content, they display lower energy intake and higher energy expenditure. And if you vagotomize them again, so you cut that link between the liver and the brain, then you abolish that response. So that clearly supports this role that perhaps carbohydrate availability influences our energy balance behaviors. So if we shift substrate utilization, maybe that also influences our our likelihood to overeat or um, be more or less physically active outside of that exercise bout. That's something that certainly needs more work, and it is certainly speculative in in this moment in time. Awesome, Javier. Thank you for clarifying that. That is really a a fascinating subject with many, many uh, things to consider. And um, that leads us straight into the the case of eating breakfast. So in the case that we do want to to eat breakfast and a cyclist is aiming to complete a certain training workload or, or compete, of course, that would be the, 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 the ultimate uh, the purpose of, uh, of breakfast and the case of when that we want to consider it, of course. What do you think it would be the, the ideal breakfast nutrient profile, not only to replenish the liver glycogen stores that we have depleted at night, but also to, to guarantee the, the best performance? Does the, does the type of carbohydrate, glucose, fructose, uh, galactose, or even the, the glycemic index, the addition of uh, protein and fat have some um, effects when it comes down uh, to exercise, or does this come to the total amount uh, of, um, of carbohydrates? Mm-hmm. Um, if we if we take a scenario of let's let's assume this athlete has a, a prolonged event. Let, let's say yeah, a Tour de France cyclist. It's, it's one of the the longer stages. Let's say five six hours coming up, and they so they want to maximize both muscle and liver glycogen stores ahead of that. Um, starting with with muscle glycogen stores, well, consuming carbohydrates in itself, it, we we need to focus on. Um, and that high glycemic index carbohydrates, so those that, that are relatively rapidly digested and absorbed and produce a big glucose and a big insulin response, have been shown by some studies to raise muscle glycogen in this resting scenario um, more, more rapidly than other forms of carbohydrates, probably mostly because of that big insulin response. So um, the muscle is going to take up the, glu- the glucose and store it as glycogen May, and that will be potentiated by insulin. So the insulin will cause um, the GLUT4, the, the transport protein, to go to the surface of the muscle and to cause more glucose to enter the muscle. But that insulin will also stimulate the processes of, of glycogen synthesis in muscle as well. So it will be directing it towards storage as, as glycogen. Um, we could use protein there to, to effectively also uh, stimulate insulin secretion. Um, and we may be able to get away with a slightly lower glycemic index carbohydrate then for breakfast as well. So um, we could, for the same amount of carbohydrate, if we lower the glycemic index, we'll get a slightly lower insulin response. But if we add some protein to that, and in particular whey protein, then we'll get a big insulin response and we could perhaps restore that increase in muscle glycogen. And the same thing kind of happens if you just lower the carbohydrate content. If you replace some of that with protein, you can still get quite a good um, synthesis of muscle glycogen because you're still getting that big insulin response. There are, of course, other factors that should be considered in terms of um, the tolerability of, of certain carbohydrates with, with certain athletes. Um, of, you may have athletes um, who can't tolerate gluten, for example, or are lactose intolerant. Uh, but if we don't um, consider those potential issues, then, um, yeah, it doesn't seem to matter what type of carbohydrates consumed for muscle glycogen repletion specifically. As long as you co-ingest some protein, then you should get a big insulin response and, and store muscle glycogen. But if we're considering total glycogen stores, 
then we also need to consider the, the liver as well. And that's where the specific type of carbohydrate really does seem to matter quite a lot more. Um, and that's because fructose and galactose, these two specific types of sugar, seem to really potently stimulate liver glycogen synthesis. Um, there are, if, I, if I just describe what these sugars are, first of all, so um, the most predominant carbohydrate in most people's diet will be glucose. So glucose, not in its free form, so fr a free glucose molecule, we, we actually rarely ingest that. Um, we commonly consume glucose in the form of um, carbohydrates such as starch. Um, so that is a, a really long chain of glucose molecules. Uh, we also consume glucose in, a, um, in sugar. Um, so the table sugar is a glucose and fructose mixture. So sucrose is a, a glucose and fructose molecule that have, that have been um, bound together. Um, galactose is um, the main sugar that's um, found in milk. So actually the, the sugar is lactose in milk, and that's comprised of one glucose molecule and one galactose molecule. So you can see a common theme is that glucose is present in, in many of the dietary carbohydrates, but then there are specific carbohydrate sources that also contain fructose and or they also contain galactose. Um, so the main sources of those are, are, as I say, table sugar containing glucose and fructose. Um, fructose is also present in, in many fruits as well. And then galactose is uh, present in lactose, which is the main milk sugar. So both of these have been shown to quite potently stimulate liver glycogen uh, synthesis, at both at rest and, and or at least fructose has been shown both at rest and post-exercise. Um, galactose has mainly been explored in that, that post-exercise state. Um, more is probably known about fructose and how it works in that role. And, and it probably works in at least two ways. One of those is that it's just providing more substrate for, for glycogen. So the fructose can be converted into glycogen. Um, but it also seems to act as a signal. So when the liver has more fructose available, that's acting as a signal to stimulate glycogen synthase. So that's the enzyme that converts glucose into glycogen. There's also some evidence, although it's more contradictory, that the fructose might suppress glycogen phosphorylase in the liver. So that's the, the breakdown of glycogen as well. So you may get a double whammy, although the evidence for the synthesis side is certainly stronger. So if an athlete is looking to rapidly restore or, or post-exercise, or, or if we're taking this pre-exercise scenario where they're looking to maximize their glycogen storage before an exercise bout, then consuming a mixture of carbohydrates, fructose and glucose, and maybe some galactose as well, um, is probably recommended to potentiate and get the most out of that, that meal in terms of storing liver and muscle glycogen. Because I should also say, if, if you co-ingest glucose and fructose in a meal compared to glucose only, you get more liver glycogen storage, but that's not at the expense of muscle glycogen. So you still get the same increase in muscle glycogen, but you get more of an increase in liver glycogen. And this effect isn't negligible. So if you look at rates of liver glycogen repletion with glucose fructose mixtures versus glucose only, the rate of synthesis is about double that um, with glucose fructose mixtures compared to glucose alone. So, so this is quite a potent effect and, and could probably be utilized to, to quite some effect. And, and in practical terms, it equates, um, you could probably achieve this just by including some honey with, um, if it's a breakfast, you're having some porridge, for example, then including some honey in that or having a fruit smoothie. Um, certainly things like that contain fructose and, and would assist with that goal. Okay, that is that is really interesting. And and of course, we, we if we try to, um, to apply that directly to the types of foods, um, there is this uh, really interesting video of uh, the Global Cycling Network uh, YouTube channel uh, in which they, uh, in the last Giro d'Italia, they've uh, interviewed pro cyclists, uh, asking them basically, what did you have for breakfast? And mm. uh, the differences were um, interesting, uh, but most of them uh, answered. It was quite a hard stage, I think. And they all answered um, oatmeal and eggs. And with a combination of them, they had both oatmeal mm -hmm. and eggs. So they, they had both a, a combination of, um, let's say, slow release, uh, um, so slow uh, digestible car carbohydrates uh, mm -hmm. and eggs. They're trying to... Uh, they're all very, very similar in between 
teams uh, and, uh, and and athletes uh, they were all aiming to do that so that leads us uh, Javier to the to the next question in which uh, do you believe that considering what you just um, told us and these kinds of patterns that we find in cycling uh, should uh, um, uh, the, the quantity of uh, of carbohydrate or should the type of of foods that we ingest in the, uh, at breakfast they should they vary according to the type of race let's say a time trial that starts with high intensity effort that has to be maintained for a short period of time and of course the athlete is not going to be able uh, to to eat anything in order not to break the time trial position uh, versus mm -hmm. a long hilly race that starts with a somewhat a softer pace in the beginning and um, uh, we ha we have to, in this context to consider that the athlete needs to eat uh, during this let's say six uh, hours, uh, five hours uh, riding. Uh, how could we take this, uh, this uh, details into consideration when considering what and how much breakfast are we consuming? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so firstly, in, in both of these scenarios, we still want to probably maximize carbohydrate availability before the event. So if we consider a one hour time trial, we might think, well, We've got enough glycogen to fuel probably 90 minutes, maybe even two hours of exercise. So so why do we need to maximize our glycogen stores if we know we've got enough there? We're not, not going to run out. Well, um, there's some interesting um, um, kind of hypothetical calculations that have been done on on the oxygen cost of exercise. Um, it's been performed by a few, few people. I think Ron Moore was probably the first to, to suggest this, uh, but may, maybe it was someone else out there. If I, if I get it wrong, then I'm sorry. But um It suggests that even if glycogen isn't limiting in the sense that you're running out of fuel, having more carbohydrate available, if you're burning more carbohydrates as a fuel, you're being more oxygen efficient. So to burn carbohydrate requires less oxygen to liberate the same amount of energy compared to, to compared to burning fat as a fuel. And the calculations that they've done suggest this is meaning that this make, can make a meaningful difference to performance in an event. It, it could be the equivalent, for example, of of running a marathon at say 81% of VO2 max to 78% of VO2 max, um, or, or the difference um, of a couple of minutes, perhaps, or at least uh, depending on, on how quick you're running, a, a minute or so over a, a marathon. Um, so burning more carbohydrate as a fuel is probably a good thing in events where even the the amount of carbohydrate there isn't necessarily limiting, but we've got um, oxygen delivery as a limiting factor. So we can then get away with less oxygen delivery for the same performance effect. Um, so there may be benefits there to, to maximizing carbohydrate availability, even in these shorter, hard intensity time trials and in these longer hilly stage races. In the time trial, one factor that we should consider, however, is because it's high intensity, um, we, we don't want to compromise any gastrointestinal discomfort. So we should probably consider a relatively easily digestible carbohydrate source. And perhaps this is a scenario where we may want to go to a slightly lower protein intake, um, but slightly more of the high Uh, high glycemic index carbohydrates so we know that they're very rapidly digested and absorbed they're not hanging around in the gut for very long um, probably a low uh, fiber breakfast um, as well and so we, we have, we've essentially got less hanging around in the gut and we're just absorbing it very quickly into the, the bloodstream whereas in the longer hilly race We still want to maximize glycogen availability at the start because as soon as we exercise, even if it's easy at the start of the race, the intensity, we're still going to be using some muscle glycogen. So we want to start with the maximum available, especially if we know that towards the end of that race, that there are going to be high intensity efforts. Um, and then throughout, we want to keep topping up with carbohydrate intake. That's probably not going to be drastically influencing muscle glycogen, but it will will help prevent liver glycogen depletion and it's also providing an additional exogenous fuel um, so with the longer stage event we can also probably get away a little bit more with um, what we eat for breakfast it's not quite as important because you can make up for some of that during the event but we still want to aim for as higher total carbohydrate availability prior to both of those events okay great javier that was really important to to clarify
and uh, having you here, Javier, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't let this opportunity or skip this opportunity to just obtain a a brief comment on you about this recent uh, meta analysis on the the consumption of uh, of breakfast um, uh, published on the in at in the British Medical Journal, in which I really liked. Uh, a Twitter comment of, of your uh, comment of your good colleague James Betts, uh, in in a series of tweets, he he said that was maybe unhelpful reporting um, uh, that this uh, recent meta analysis provided, um, and I believe maybe you uh, or not you uh, maybe agree with him. Can we have some comments uh, of you uh, on this? Yeah. Um... Firstly, I think it's it, probably with all nutrition studies, unless you're looking at very specific supplementation of specific nutrients, meta-analyses are, are really tricky. And that's because they're, they're much easier if you've got um, – if you're comparing like with like across studies. So if you take, for example, supplementation of, let's say, vitamin D, um, then most of those forms of vitamin D may be very similar forms. So you're – assessing like with like and maybe the only difference then is the dose that was given and then you're looking at a certain outcome so all of these studies you pull together um so i should probably explain what a meta-analysis is for, for the listeners in case they're not aware a meta-analysis is is where you analyze all of the data that's already been published so let's say there's been a hundred studies that have all looked at the effect of vitamin d supplementation or the effect of breakfast consumption on a certain outcome, which could be weight loss, it could be performance, it could be health. And you try to statistically pool all of that data together to get a single outcome. And, and the reason we do that is an individual study might be underpowered. We might not have enough of a sample size, enough participants in that study to draw a confident conclusion on, on what's actually happening. Whereas if we pool all of that evidence together, we can get a more confident estimate of the true effect. So that works if we've got a relatively simple intervention and everyone's measured the same outcome in the same way. That's much more tricky if there's variability in the intervention and variability in the outcome measure as well. Um, so if you take breakfast consumption, this is where it falls down quite heavily because, as we mentioned right at the start, the, the definition of breakfast is really tricky and it varies in the different studies that have been, been employed. Also, The outcome measures can also vary as well. So one of the outcome measures in this study was body weight, which is, is clearly can be um, compared across studies quite, quite easily. But the other is energy intake, and that can be done in a variety of ways. It can be done with uh, self-report. It can be done with observation of people's food intake. It can be done with food frequency questionnaires versus weighed food diaries. And, and all of these have limitations. All of them have a few strengths as well. But energy intake is probably one of the hardest things we can measure in, in nutrition as, as well. So it's subject to, to a number of limitations and, and there's probably not one valid way of measuring that other than directly observing people in a laboratory environment. Um, so having said all that, um, this meta-analysis has tried to combine all of the, the previous published literature on breakfast consumption And the outcomes were that they were interested in were body weight and energy intake. And the main take home was that these trials seem to suggest there's no effect on body weight and that breakfast intake increases daily energy intake. That's consistent with some of the individual randomized controlled trials that, that um, we mentioned earlier on. And one of those being one that James Betts conducted himself. I think the way it was reported could be slightly misleading uh, in that. Yes, breakfast may not influence body weight. That's certainly not the same as body composition. It's also not necessarily the most important health outcome. Um, so I know that in a, in a single paper, you can't cover everything. So the, the conclusion of the paper, if it's left at, it seems like breakfast consumption doesn't drastically influence body weight, then that's, that's probably an accurate reflection of, of the literature. Um, one of the points put across in the, the paper was that um, the studies were um, were weak in their design. So um, the main factor for that, at least for 
that was consistent across all of the studies was that, that there was a lack of blinding. Now, I'm not sure of, of a way in which you could truly blind breakfast consumption. And of course, it, it depends on your definition of breakfast. Um, maybe you could blind the outcome measure, which could be a way going forward. So people are aware that they're randomized to a breakfast versus a fasting group, um, but that you don't tell them what you're actually measuring as an outcome. And, and maybe that's one way to try and get around that. But um, yeah, it's, it's tricky to, to blind breakfast consumption. And um, that's probably my, my overall take on, on that meta-analysis, if that's helpful. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. I think it's really important because some people uh, might uh, misinterpret these kinds of uh, meta-analysis. And on this particular case, it's, it was a really... It's a really difficult uh, meta-analysis to, to perform and uh, conclusions are probably not not what we want to get out there according to the evidence we have uh, so far. So this, uh, all this stuff has to be uh, interpreted with some some caution. So Javier, the, the wrap it up question, if just to, uh, to sum everything up, if you were working with a cyclist looking to improve uh, performance, what practical advices would you give him or her? In order for him, uh, in order for him to implement the strategies that uh, we've been discussing, mm -hmm. um, so I, I'd advise that they do um, a, a mixture of um, consuming breakfast on some days, uh, on days where they've got a particularly intense session that they want to maximize their performance on, and certainly in, in competition, um, and then vary that with other days when. The, perhaps the intensity of the session isn't going to be high or um, they want to specifically promote certain adaptations in their muscle, then they should perhaps consider performing those sessions in a fasted state. Um, whether they achieve that with um, a, essentially a true fasted state exercise or whether they just do a carbohydrate restriction would probably depend on the athlete preferences and their, their specific goals at that time. Maybe if you've got an athlete who is commonly getting stress fractures, then you may not want to do so much of the fasted exercise training. And you could use some of the protein intake there too, which has been shown by some to, to suppress these markers of, of bone, bone breakdown during exercise. Um, so essentially, it would be to, to vary it. Um, and when performance um, should be maximized, then consuming a high carbohydrate breakfast um, containing a mixture of carbohydrate sources and also some protein as well. And then um, performing some sessions with some form of carbohydrate availability with or without protein, depending on, on the type of athlete you're working with. Yeah, sure. Clearly uh, adapting carbohydrate intake to the intensity of what you are uh, going to perform. The, clearly the idea proposed by um, Samuel Impe and, and James Morton on the fuel for the work required uh, research. Uh, would probably be the, the best uh, strategy. We're not here in this podcast um, advocating that we you have to, you must do uh, uh, fasted uh, workouts uh, all the time. No, that we are just mm -hmm. clarifying what are the advantages and, and in which context do they uh, apply. So I think uh, that sums it all up, I guess. So Javier, if people uh, want to find more about the, the work that you've done or that you're involved in right now, and essentially, well, just be up to date with your research, where can people go? Yeah, um, so there's a, a the university website, University of Bath, and um, I, I'm on there. All my publications should, should be on there too, um, on our research portal. But also probably the, the easiest place to link to that is probably through my Twitter profile as well. So that's at Gonzalez underscore jt and that's gonzalez with two z's i know i'm not speedy gonzalez with an s but but with two z's I'm not, i'm not quick enough to be to be speedy <laughs> yes you need to have breakfast to be that, that speedy <laughs> of course um i can confirm that uh, javier is uh, quite active on twitter uh, so it could it would be a good uh, place to to follow him and i will leave the, all these links on the show notes on fuelthepedal.com So, Javier, thank you so much again for taking the time to, to be with us. I know you, you have, made, you have a, a very busy schedule, and um, for that I really, really appreciate. And it was an honor having you as the first guest of the podcast. No problem. Yeah, the pleasure is mine. Thank you for the invite. Okay, my pleasure, Javier. I've learned uh, a lot, and truly I hope our listeners have too.
this was Fuel the Pedal Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and I hope to have you guys on following episodes. So this was Javier Gonzalez from the University of Bath. Hopefully you took something interesting from this discussion, whether if you're a cyclist, a sports nutritionist, a cycling coach, or simply if you're a cycling enthusiast looking to know more about cycling nutrition and all these interesting uh, things behind it. If you did enjoy this episode, uh, I'd really appreciate if you could share it with your peers through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or any other platform. Tell your friends about it. Any form of sharing will be appreciated. The show notes of this episode will be on fuelthepedal.com and you can listen to these and other episodes directly on the player available on fuelthepedal.com as well. You can also subscribe to the show on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn. We're just having some problems uploading to iTunes, but hopefully we will be able to solve it soon. So that's pretty much it, guys. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for the next episodes.